the entire Genshin Impact story so far. Recap of the entire story of Genshin. All right, let's watch this very happy, very chill video. And now I'm gonna eat my dinner. Genshin Impact before the release of version 5.0. I'll be uploading summaries of the Netland Archon Quest as they release, but for now, if you needed a quick refresher on what's happened so far, then here it is. The story starts with our oh, favorite yeah, little extraterrestrials, Genshin, Traveler and their sibling, who descended to this strange land of Teyvat in the form of a falling star. As they try to leave this, they are stopped and separated by an entity that calls herself the Sustainer of Heavenly Principles, more commonly known as the Unknown God. Isn't she the bitch from Honga and Battery? A seal was apparently placed on Traveler, causing them to lose their power. After being separated for an undetermined number of years, Traveler is now in Mondstadt with a floating fairy called Paimon who acts as their travel guide and teaches them all they need to know about the world of Teyvat. The seven nations of Teyvat are all ruled by the seven archons, gods chosen by a divine hierarchy known as Celestia to rule over the lands and their respective elements. If I had to rank them on power levels, rank one, Brighton Shogun. Rank 2, Nahida. Rank 3, Himiko. Rank 4, Zhongli. Rank 5, Venti. And rank 6, Farina. If I had random power level. Elements. Visions are items used as conduits for elemental power. These visions are granted to select few people in Teyvat by the celestial deities. It's said that vision holders might have the chance to become gods themselves in hopes that they too could I have no idea what I do, but I'm just basing it on the vibe. It's the vibes. Is a vibes, right? Is a vibes. Send to Celestia. Just note that Archons and Jongli gives off brokey vibes. If she was so fucking strong, she wouldn't give off brokey vibes, right? So let's keep it. Selves don't give visions because they're apparently the bottom of the barrel when it comes to the divine hierarchy. The takeaway from this is that Celestia is scary. The first of the seven nations is Munchtad, which worships the animal Archon Barbados. As a city of freedom, the Archon Barbados has taken a more hands off approach in ruling. So although the city has an entire church and religion that actively worships him, Barbados is relatively absent. The Knights of Favonius functions as Monchstad's leading authority with She could have been an Archon, and I wouldn't even be mad. God damn. Jean as the acting Grand Master, while Grandmaster Varka is away on an undisclosed expedition. Monchstad's major crisis is that a dragon named Storm Terror has unleashed violent windstorms threatening to destroy the city. The Knights of Favonius have a plan, and as an honorary knight, Traveler is compelled to help. The plan is to cut off Storm Terror's power supply, which are crystals located in Mondstadt's major temples. But there's an issue. Storm Terror's real name is Devalin, and contrary to current belief, Devalin was actually a good dragon, who's even one of the four legendary protectors of Mondstadt. So what turned him evil? 500 years He's all chats, search history. Ago, Teyvat faced a worldwide crisis known as the Cataclysm. The nation of Conria fell, and abyssal creatures ran rampant, destroying everything in sight. A wicked dragon named Durin attacked Mondstadt, prompting the animal Archon Barbados and the dragon Devalin to fight back. Durin is successfully killed by Devalin's fatal bite to his throat, but Devalin inadvertently swallows Durin's poisonous blood. After the battle, Devalin hibernates and returns to Mondstadt centuries later. However, with his honorable deeds forgotten, the people of Mondstadt cowered in fear. Devalin retreats in betrayal and pain, which exacerbates the effects of the poisonous blood in his body. Now subject to the call of the abyss, Devalin seeks revenge on Mondstadt. The only way to stop him is to purify the abyssal corruption in his blood. Conveniently, a mysterious bard named Venti seems to know how to do it. After stealing the legendary Lyre de Hermel, a tool belonging to the Animal Archon, the group heads to Star Snatch Cliff to summon and purify Devalin, but their plans are thwarted by an abyss mage. This abyss mage is from a nefarious faction known as the Abyss Order, which seeks to destroy the Seven Nations out of revenge for the fall of Conria, the kingdom that fell during the Cataclysm 500 years ago. One bomb. Traveler and the group go to Storm Terror's lair and manage to free Devalin from his abyssal corruption and from the Abyss Order. All's well that ends well or so it seems, until a Fatui Harbinger named La Senora steals Oh my gosh, she is so fine. Order. All's well that ends well or so it seems, until a Fatui Oh my gosh, she is so fine. When she first came up- I cannot believe she's- Exactly, it's a crime. I cannot believe she's not playable. How the f what the f are they even thinking? How is she not playable? The harbinger named La Senora steals a Gnosis from Venti. Venti is actually the animal Archon Barbados in disguise, and this Gnosis was a device used by the Archons to tap into the powers of Celestia. La Senora comes from a faction known as the Fatui, which is based in Snezhnaya, Tevat's nation of ice led by the Cryo Archon, the Saritza. 
The Fatui's motive is to gain control of all the Archon's powers by collecting their Gnosis. Mondstadt is actually one of the few places to have history with Natlan. According to the Genshin webcomics, a thousand years ago, a tribe from Natlan was enslaved by the Lawrence clan who took advantage of Barbados' absence and ruled Mondstadt as tyrants. The Natlan hero Vanessa with the help of Barbados would free Mondstadt from the aristocracy, and she would later become one of Mondstadt's legendary protectors, the Falcon of the West of the Four Winds. Vanessa would also become one of only- Okay, how am I ever gonna know the lore of Genshin Impact if their lore is literally not even in the game? Their lore is literally not even in the game. It's, it is from a f***ing web comic. How am I gonna know this? Only two people in recorded history to ever ascend to Celestia, the other being Guha from the Yue. To briefly recap Monchad's story, the situation with Devalin has been resolved. The windstorms have disappeared and Devalin is no longer a vengeful dragon. Monchad is more or less the same as it was prior to Devalin's rampage. The animal Archon is still relatively absent, allowing the people of Monchad to live in freedom, and things appear to be peaceful so far. The Fatui have one out of seven Gnosis. Just a quick Oh, we're Genji back too? All right, true, 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 yep. Quick note, even though the Fatui operate under the orders of the Cryo Archon, we don't really know the state of the Cryonosis. So until we read... Checked on this. Thank you. ...each Snezhnaya and know for sure, the Cryonosis won't be counted just yet. Okay, so we helped out Munchdad, so surely we'll have some information on where we can find our sibling, right? You know, the sibling we lost in the beginning of the story. The reason we're on this journey in the first place. A weekend Venti unfortunately has no clue where the sibling is, but encourages Traveler and Paimon to visit Li Yue, the nation led by the Geo Archon. Once every year, the Geo Archon descends during the Rite yeah, yeah. of Dissension. A ceremony where yeah, the yeah. Geo Archon himself descends in his dragon form to give his predictions on the business trends that will shape the Yue's economy for the year. So sh so bro is a spy. Bro is, bro is Wall Street. Instead. Surely, if we catch a Geo Archon, he'll have some information on our sibling, right? The Yue is considered the most prosperous nation in all of Teyvat, and it's also where Mora, the global currency, is minted via the power of the Geo Gnosis. The nation is- How the f*** is Li Yue the richest nation in all of Teyvat? When it's- at, when it's- when it's Argon, is literally a brokey. It's under the rule of Rex Lapis, the Geo Archon and God of Contracts, and the governing bodies include the Adepti and the Qixing. The Adepti are illuminated beasts and gods elected by Rex Lapis, while the Qixing is a committee made up of seven business leaders who implement the policies laid out by Rex Lapis. The Adepti and the Qixing disagree with the way the Yue's affairs are being handled. The Adepti believe humans are too weak Ningguang to fend for themselves, and the Qixing believe humans are actually self-sufficient without the Adepti. Ningguang is the member of the Qixing selected to perform this year's Rite of Dissension. She's the owner of the luxurious jade chamber you see floating in the sky. Unfortunately this year, Rex Lapis ascends dead, and due to being a foreigner, Traveler is suspected of his murder. Traveler is saved by child, a Fatui Harbinger. Ningguang has to- So they are racist, basically. Exactly. Suspicions that the Fatui are in the Yue to cause mass hysteria. With Rex Lapis dead, a government restructure is definitely needed. So the Fatui are here to cast doubt amongst the citizens, cause panic, and while everyone's distracted, snatch the Geonosis from Rex Lapis's heavily guarded body. Zhongli is a consultant of the Wangsheng Funeral Parlor and is tasked with giving Rex Lapis a proper burial. Traveler assists Zhongli and procures special items for the funeral ceremony known as the Rite of Parting. As Ningguang predicted, the Fatui caused mass panic, so Traveler confronts Child at the Golden House where apparently Rex Lapis's body is being stored. Child reaches into Rex Lapis's body to grab the Gnosis, only for it to be dun dun empty. What A battle fuck? ensues. In an attempt to force the Geo Archon to show himself and surrender the Geo Gnosis, Child summons the sea god Osile, an ancient god that had tormented the Yue in the past. At this point, the Qixing and the Adepti put their political differences aside and protect Li Yue from imminent danger. Ningguang drops the Jade Chamber on a style, sealing him once and for all. Traveler seeks out Zhongli and is surprised to find him with La Signora and Child. Apparently, Zhongli is actually the Geo Archon Rex Lapis. He faked his own death and has been living amongst the humans as a consultant of the Wangsheng Funeral Parlor. All this was done as part of a contract with the Fatui and also to test the people of Liyue to see if they can survive without an Archon's rule. <laughs> just imagine while Liyue is falling apart, Zhongli's just picking flowers for his own funeral. As per the contract, Zhongli willingly surrenders his Gnosis to the Fatui. Here's the state of Liyue after its Archon quests. Mora, the global currency of Teyvat, 
was being minted by the Geonosis. Now that Zhongli has surrendered the Gnosis to the Fatui, no new Mora is currently being minted. Zhongli admits that he didn't have an alternative plan for his resignation as an Archon and calls this a major issue from a financial standpoint. He literally just went, oops, <laughs> and then just went into retirement. The Qixing now operates solely. This lore video is kind of funny. Yo, chat, let me, let me pause. I have one more, I have one more thing. As the decision makers behind the US policies and regulations, with the Adepti stepping back to let humans do their own thing. Ningguang later rebuilds the Jade Chamber during the interlude chapter, The Crane Returns on the Wind. The Fatui have two out of seven Gnosis. Surely though, since we've helped two nations with their problems and Zhongli seems to be old and wise, he must know a thing or two about our missing alien sibling, right? Well, he doesn't, and Zhongli tells Traveler and Paimon to head over to Inazuma since news of his death will cause the Electro Archon to move on forward with her plans. Now, if you want to go to Natland, you can now after getting to this point in the main storyline. 5.0 makes it possible for new players to go to Natland right after Liyue. But on to the next region. Why, why would you do that? If you don't care about story. Okay. Region and chronological order of release. Inazuma is ruled by the Electro Archon A, and the Raiden Shogun is the stoic puppet she uses as her mortal vessel. It's kinda like her fursona. In the past year, Inazuma has been in isolationism due to the Sakoku Decree. Violent windstorms around the region make sea travel nearly impossible. There's also a Vision Hunt Decree in effect to confiscate all visions from vision holders. Those who don't turn in their visions would be punished. For some reason, due to diplomatic immunity, the Fatui are able to freely enter the country. Arguably, out of the region so far, Inazuma is in the worst socio-political condition. Aside from the Electro Archon, Inazuma is also led by the Tri Commission three organizations who oversee various matters. More than half the members are actually corrupt. Inazuma is also in the middle of a civil war waged against the Electro Archon by the Sangonomiya clan. Yikes. Traveler and Paimon get to Inazuma safely with the help of Beidou and Kazuha, yeah, and are put under the care of Toma. He introduces them to the Kamisato clan's princess, Kamisato Ayaka, who upon hearing Traveler's deeds in Monstad and Liyue, hopes to get their aid in Inazuma's affairs as well. She wet sock dances her way into Traveler's heart and tries to convince Traveler to their side. Toma is apprehended by the Tenryu Commission and the Electro Archon herself will separate him from his vision. Traveler and Paimon attempt to rescue him but are overwhelmed by her power. The group retreats to Watatsumi Island for safety and work with Kokomi and the Resistance Group. The Fatui and the corrupt members of the Tri Commission have been working together to whittle down the Resistance Army. The Fatui had been secretly funneling in delusions to the Resistance War Warriors, and these delusions are basically off-brand knockoff visions which deplete the wearer's life force over time, subsequently oh, killing them. Tra oh, so that's how the guy died, right? There was this guy, and then he slowly became old and just died. Miller wants revenge and attempts to destroy the delusion factory, but he's efficiently stopped by Fatui Harbinger Scaramouche. He's rescued by Yaimiko, the head of the Narukami Shrine. As the Electro Archon's familiar, she's aware of her weaknesses and trains Traveler in the ways of beating the Raiden Shogun. Also as her familiar, Yaimiko was tasked with protecting the Electro Gnosis. In order to spare Traveler, Yaimiko bargained with Scaramouche. Traveler's life in exchange for the Electronosis. Obviously, Scaramouche agrees. With the help of Yaimiko, Traveler is able to turn some commissioned members to their side by exposing the more corrupt members' involvement with the Fatui. The Fatui's plan was to destabilize Inazuma and create a market for their delusions, and they achieved this by bribing both the Tenryu and Kanjo commissions. The group proceeds to bring their findings to the Raiden Shogun, but surprisingly find her with Fatui Harbinger La Signora. For kicking Venti, taking the Gnosis from Zhongli Harabuji, and all the atrocities committed in Inazuma, Azuma, Traveler challenges La Signora to a duel. The loser is killed by the Raiden Shogun's Muso no Hitotachi. So, uh, bye bye, La Signora, I guess. I wanted her to be. I think she's coming back. I feel like she's coming back, you know? She doesn't wait to just die like this. Probably coming back. Playable so badly, and now I just feel bad for the poor Fatui intern that had to collect her with the dustpan. The Electro Archon A reveals that she was aware of the Fatui's meddling in Inazuma and allowed it because it posed no threat to her ideals of eternity, in which everything stays the same forever. During the Cataclysm 500 years ago, her dearest friends and sister, the previous Electro Archon, were killed. 
Since she suffered so much loss from the process of progress, her solution was to keep herself and Inazuma locked in a state of eternity. Enjoy, uh, Traveler challenges soup. her to a duel, and with Yaimiko's persuasion, uh, okay. the Electro Archon A surrenders. This is the state of Inazuma after the Archon quests. The Vision Hunt decree is abolished, and visions are returned to their rightful owners. The Sakoku decree is lifted later during Raiden Shogun's Act 2 story quest, causing an influx of visitors and trade to the country. The corrupt Kanjo and Tenryu commissioners are arrested for their involvement with the Fatui. A later finds new resolve as a leader and she begins to play a more active role. I completely didn't play this, by the way. I think I, we completely didn't play this. At the moment they said, oh, we can go to Sumeru, I bounced. Fuck Inazuma. I just went to Sumeru. In Inazuma's policies. Inazuma seems to be moving towards a more progressive future post Archon quests. The Fatui have three out of seven Gnosis. Yaimiko encourages Traveler and Paimon to go to Sumeru, and this is where the Inazuma Archon quests end. Sumeru is the land of plants and knowledge, and it's led by the Dendra Archon Kusanali. The is the land of dreams. Otherwise known as Penakuni. God of Wisdom. Sumeru Academia is Teyvat's largest known academic center and functions as the nation's governing body. The Matra are disciplinary officers for the academia and enforce the institute's integrity. The Aramites are a loosely organized mercenary corps in the Sumeru desert that accept commissions from various organizations depending on the pay. Knowledge is managed as a resource through a device known as the Akasha system, which was invented by the previous Dendro Archon Rukadevata, and this system is currently being powered by the Dendro Gnosis and managed by the Academia. The people of Sumeru are connected to all the information in the Akasha system via the Akasha terminals. For some reason, the people of Sumeru don't have the ability to dream. The political state of Sumeru is kinda sad. The leading sages of the Academia reject Kusanali as their Archon in favor of the former Rukadevata. As a result, Kusanali lives in seclusion and has very little control over the affairs of Sumeru. Those with faith in Kusanali are very few, and this development has caused the corrupt sages of the academia to have free reign. Sumeru is affected by the withering, corruption that happened after a ruling King wave. Deshra introduced forbidden knowledge to his people. Forbidden knowledge is a type of wisdom that comes from outside of Teyvat. The withering causes areas of the land to rapidly deteriorate and decay, and the effect on humans is a disease known as Elazar, whose symptoms include the hardening of one's skin until fatigue, Got being a cool robot in there, this. Nerve damage and finally necrosis occurs, causing permanent immobility. Traveler and Paimon arrive to Sumeru City with the help of Tugnedi and Kale. Trying to see the Dendro Archon is going to be difficult, so they get the help of Dunyarzad and her guardian Dihya. Dunyarzad is a rare follower of Kusanali and has volunteered to organize this year's Subzeru's Festival, a celebration dedicated to Kusanali's birthday. The festival is later shut down by the Grand Sage of the Academia and weird things start happening where everyone experiences the same day over and over again. A girl named Nahida reveals herself to be the Dendro Archon the Kusanali Sunday. and exposes the mass dream harvest scheme. Everyone has been trapped in a samsara, a constant loop of the day of the Subserious Festival. Everyone's Akasha terminals were being used by the Academia to farm the dreams of the people of Sumeru. The process works by separating one's consciousness and placing it into a host dream, which in this case happens to be Nilu's dream. Nilu's the host. The now vacant dream gets harvested at the end of every samsara cycle or loop. But why dreams? Nahida notes that dreams are rich bundles of human wisdom since the mind is most active when dreaming. However, this constant state of dreaming causes fatigue. In order to stop the samsara, they have to wake up Nilu. The mass dream harvest scheme was an experiment started by Fatui Harbinger Il Dottore and a promise Il to provide the academia with a new god, superior to Nahida. The vessel for this new god is fellow harbinger Scaramouche, who has the electronosis from Inazuma. Nahida and Traveler defeat the the newly born god Scaramouche and remove the Electronosis powering his new form. Scaramouche is taken into Nahida's custody and recovers in what a secret a location fraud. in the meantime. Using both the Dendro and Electronosis, Nahida and Traveler access the previous Dendro Archon's final memory for her wisdom to help them. Oh shit! Holy shit! Yo, where, 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 where is this? Where is this? That's Ruka Devada. Wait, what quest is this? Oh, it's fan mate. Holy sh the crazy Yo, I swear so there's something about elves, guys. There's something about elves. They just take the right spots, you know? Something about elves. I don't know what. Fix Sumeru's entire situation. The previous Dendro Archon Rukutavata had created Nahida oh as a branch God. from the Airmental Tree to Diabolical. serve as her next reincarnation. During the Cataclysm, Rukutavata was tasked with the huge job of protecting huge. the Airmental from the withering slash from the watering waves. The Airmental Tree is a database for all information. All legal purposes. I love both Oyo games and Kuro games. I love watering waves. I love Kenshi Impact. I love Zenith and I love Hungry Starbucks, right? I love all games. So, yeah, just.
This is, this is a joke. And memories of Teyvat. So whatever happened in the world and who existed in it will all be recorded in the Irminsul. Unfortunately, Ruka Tevata is affected by the withering, and in order to clear the corruption and save the Irminsul tree as well as Sumeru and potentially all of Teyvat, Nahira needs to remove all traces of Ruka Tevata's corrupted existence and memories in the Irminsul. It's a painful moment, but Nahida finally obliges. The Airman Soul is restored and the withering completely goes away, meaning all people suffering from Elazar are finally cured. The entire world essentially forgets Rukadevata, and only Traveler remembers her since they're not part of this world. Changes to the Airman Soul only seem to affect people that are of Teyvat. Yildetora negotiates with Nahida for the Dendro and Electronosis, and through this exchange, Nahida learns the truth of this world, which is the fact that the stars and skies of Teyvat are alive. I still have Here's no fucking idea what Sumeru I mean. after the Archon quests. No one in the world remembers Ruka Devata, and Nahida is worshipped and believed to be the only Dendro Archon. Nahida now oversees all matters and affairs in Sumeru. The Akasha system was shut down as a result of it no longer being powered by the Dendro Gnosis, and as a result, the people of Sumeru can experience dreams again. The withering was eradicated from Sumeru, meaning no more withering zones and no more Elazar. Scaramouche no tries more. to remove his prior existence from the Airman Soul in Ruka Devata style, but comes back into existence as Wanderer. The Fatui Harbingers have an empty Six spot that's been vacant for years as Scaramouche technically never existed. The Fatui have four out of seven Gnosis. The but next thing Traveler gonna get and Paimon go to is Fontaine, which is ruled by the Hydra Archon, a seemingly pompous pantomimus named Farina. The Harbinger it's the of most drama. technically advanced nation out of the seven, and it prides itself in its art, culture, and scientific achievements. The nation has a notoriously complex law system in place, and the tiniest infractions are considered crimes that come with severe punishment. The Mechishuse Phantom is a nation of law enforcement. <laughs> Individuals are judged in the court of Fontaine, and although overseen by the Udex Nulet, the final verdict is given by a device called the Oratrice Mechanique d'Analyse Cardinale. The Oratrice was invented by the Hydro Archon to convert people's belief in yeah. justice into Indemnidium, which is the nation's unique energy source. However, Fontaine has been facing an energy crisis, and the threat of destruction looms over the nation. An ancient prophecy has caused panic amongst the citizens. The prophecy dictates that all inhabitants of Fontaine are born with sin Fontaine. that cannot be oh resolved. It's not even Fontaine, it's Fontaine. This is a proper pronunciation. It's Fontaine. There's a little huh. You get what I'm saying? Like, there's always a little huh in, in a. It's not, it's not croissant, it's croissant. You know what I'm saying? As to do. Rise and all the people will be drowned Fontaine. and dissolved. During this great flood, the sins of the people will be washed away. Oh, I'm I'm Only the Hydro Archon yes. will remain, weeping on her throne. The Fontaine Archon quest can be broken up into three major acts. The Murder Mystery Act, the Prison Act, and the Final Act. In the Murder Mystery Act, a serial killer is going around dissolving Fontanian women. Apparently, the people from Fontaine are built different and water from a place called the Prim- Built different! Like Tyler fucking one, and there it is. Mordial C can kill them slash dissolve them. The three suspects are Linny, Child, and a man named Marcel. Linny is cleared of all charges, Marcel. and it just so happened he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. We also learned that Linny and his siblings work for the Fatui Harbinger Arlecchino and the House of the Hearth. Marcel Arlecchino. is revealed to- Arlecchino sounds Italian, not gonna lie. A little bit Italian. It's like the fucking Italian mafia, you no? Know? Oh, you fucking me. Is it a bit deep? What, what did they say again? I'm telling you that you don't come near my daughter. ...to be the serial killer and had done so as an experiment to bring back his dead wife who had accidentally dissolved in the primordial sea. The Oratrice charges Marcel as guilty for dissolving Fontanian women, but for some reason, it also charges Child guilty of the crime as well, even though he's clearly innocent. Nouvellet apprehends Child, and Child is sent to the Fortress of Meripi, the National Prison. This is where we enter the Prison Act. The Tui Harbinger Adelikino bargains with Nouvellet to secure the safety of Child. However, shortly after being incarcerated in the Fortress of Meripi, Child has suddenly gone missing. Yeah, Traveler and Paimon are sent to Meripi to investigate Child's disappearance. In yep. doing so, we learn that Child is in the Primordial Sea with an abyssal narwhal. The fortress of Meripede was built by the previous Hydro Archon, Egeria, in order to seal the Primordial Sea. This abyssal narwhal has been harnessing the power of the Primordial Sea and has caused tremors throughout the land. The Primordial Sea starts leaking and is quickly sealed by Nuvillette. Unfortunately, the tremors and- I love how this entire lore summary so far, there was zero mention of Actree. It's like Actree didn't even exist. Because we just went into the prison and we, and we, we jump around on some locks. And we, we found Zadrani and we ate food for like the entire act tree. Absolutely diabolical. The leakage of the primordial sea have destroyed parts of Fontaine, namely Poisson, 
where Navia and Espina di Rosula live. My Twitch chat keeps asking for this, so I'll do it once here. <clears throat> Navia! This unfortunate incident causes mass cap- <laughs> Wait, she streams? Wait, she streams? Yo, no shot. Wait, she streams? <laughs> Wait, what's the- what's the- she's talking on the Twitch link? Oh, she's- she's an IRL streamer. She's an Emmy matcha. Oh my god, she doesn't stream anymore. Oh my god, her last stream is the last month, guys. What is she doing? Oh, Power Lightning said, I got the video from Pozzon. Luis, it's good to see you. What's up? Bill, welcome in. Willow Tree, it's good to see you too. Bartholomew said, it's new Villa. Hydro Dragon, don't cry. You don't cry. He's crying because Natlan is lacking in representation. I feel. Damn, she streams next time. We'll raid her. If she streams next time. That's really good. Yo, yo more shout out Min's Live. If she ever streams again next time. She reminds me of Emmy Macha, straight up. Imagine Emmy Macha by like a lord cube. R.I.P. Silver and Malouse, man. This prompts the group to investigate the truth behind the prophecy. Now on to the final act. After uncovering ancient ruins, the group spot a mural related to the prophecy. However, a slate from the mural appears to be missing. Asking Farina about the prophecy slates causes her to become emotional and she flees, claiming to know nothing about it. Farina's inability to save Poisson from the primordial waters causes doubt about her Archon status and so she's put on trial for being a fake Archon. Poor Farina is tried and tested and it turns out she doesn't even have power over the Hydro <laughs> element. What a fuck in you fact, fraud. her abilities are very much in line with a normal visionless human. The final verdict goes out and the oratrice declares the hydro archon guilty with her offense punishable by death and there it is. even though the trial just proved that farina was not the hydro archon Flamina appears having retrieved the missing prophecy slate from the ruins and this is the true story in the ancient past ocean okay should i just pause here because i feel like there might be spoilers for freedom's question i just pause here because i mean we, we we literally just played like last week so that like we, we all know what the fuck is going on yeah we good we good okay excellent 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 video the entire Genshin Import story so far. Recap. Excellent video. Uh, by means. You have coomed your last coom, my man.